Chapter 34, The Twelve Spies. This chapter is based on Numbers 13 and 14. Eleven days after leaving Mount Horeb, the Hebrew host encamped at Kadesh in the wilderness of Paran, which was not far from the borders of the Promised Land. Here it was proposed by the people that spies be sent up to survey the country. The matter was presented before the Lord by Moses, and permission was granted with the direction that one of the rulers of each tribe should be selected for this purpose. The men were chosen as had been directed, and Moses bade them go and see the country, what it was, its situation and natural advantages, and the people that dwelt therein, whether they were strong or weak, few or many. Also to observe the nature of the soil and its productiveness, and to bring the fruit of the land. They went and surveyed the whole land, entering at the southern border and proceeding to the northern extremity. They returned after an absence of forty days. The people of Israel were cherishing high hopes and were waiting in eager expectancy. The news of the spies' return was carried from tribe to tribe and was hailed with rejoicing. The people rushed out to meet the messengers, who had safely escaped the dangers of their perilous undertaking. The spies brought specimens of the fruit, showing the fertility of the soil. It was in the time of ripe grapes, and they brought a cluster of grapes so large that it was carried between two men. They also brought of the figs and pomegranates, which grew there in abundance. The people rejoiced that they were to come into possession of so goodly a land, and they listened intently as the report was brought to Moses, that not a word should escape them. We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, the spies began, and surely it floweth with milk and honey and this is the fruit of it. The people were enthusiastic. They would eagerly obey the voice of the Lord and go up at once to possess the land. But, after describing the beauty and the fertility of the land, all but two of the spies enlarged upon the difficulties and dangers that lay before the Israelites should they undertake the conquest of Canaan. They enumerated the powerful nations located in various parts of the country, and said that the cities were walled and very great, and the people who dwelt therein were strong, and it would be impossible to conquer them. They also stated that they had seen giants, the sons of Anak, there, and it was useless to think of possessing the land. Now the scene changed. Hope and courage gave place to cowardly despair, as the spies uttered the sentiments of their unbelieving hearts which were filled with discouragement and prompted by Satan. Their unbelief cast a gloomy shadow over the congregation, and the mighty power of God so often manifested in behalf of the chosen nation was forgotten. The people did not wait to reflect. They did not reason that he who had brought them thus far would certainly give them the land. They did not call to mind how wonderfully God had delivered them from their oppressors, cutting a path through the sea, and destroying the pursuing hosts of Pharaoh. They left God out of the question, and acted as though they must depend solely on the power of arms. In their unbelief they limited the power of God, and distrusted the hand that had hitherto safely guided them. And they repeated their former error of murmuring against Moses and Aaron. This, then, is the end of our high hopes, they said, This is the land we have traveled all the way from Egypt to possess. They accused their leaders of deceiving the people and bringing trouble upon Israel. The people were desperate in their disappointment and despair. A wail of agony arose and mingled with the confused murmur of voices. Caleb comprehended the situation, and bold to stand in defense of the word of God, he did all in his power to counteract the evil influence of his unfaithful associates. For an instant, the people were still to listen to his words of hope and courage respecting the goodly land. He did not contradict what had already been said. The walls were high, and the Canaanites strong, but God had promised the land to Israel. Let us go up at once and possess it, urged Caleb, for we are well able to overcome it. But the ten, interrupting him, pictured the obstacles in darker colors than at first. We be not able to go up against the people, they declared, for they are stronger than we. All the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, 
and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. These men, having entered upon a wrong course, stubbornly set themselves against Caleb and Joshua, against Moses, and against God. Every advance step rendered them the more determined. They were resolved to discourage all effort to gain possession of Canaan. They distorted the truth in order to sustain their baleful influence. It is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, they said. This was not only an evil report, but it was also a lying one. It was inconsistent with itself. The spies had declared the country to be fruitful and prosperous, and the people of giant stature, all of which would be impossible if the climate were so unhealthful that the land could be said to eat up the inhabitants. But when men yield their hearts to unbelief, they place themselves under the control of Satan, and none can tell to what lengths he will lead them. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. Revolt and open mutiny quickly followed, for Satan had full sway and the people seemed bereft of reason. They cursed Moses and Aaron, forgetting that God hearkened to their wicked speeches, and that, enshrouded in the cloudy pillar, the angel of his presence was witnessing their terrible outburst of wrath. In bitterness they cried out, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness! Then their feelings rose against God. Wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land, to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, Let us make a captain, and let us return into Egypt. Thus they accused not only Moses, but God himself of deception, in promising them a land which they were not able to possess. And they went so far as to appoint a captain to lead them back to the land of their sufferings and bondage, from which they had been delivered by the strong arm of omnipotence. In humiliation and distress, Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel, not knowing what to do to turn them from their rash and passionate purpose. Caleb and Joshua attempted to quiet the tumult. With their garments rent in token of grief and indignation, they rushed in among the people, and their ringing voices were heard above the tempest of lamentation and rebellious grief. The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord." neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. The Canaanites had filled up the measure of their iniquity, and the Lord would no longer bear with them. His protection being removed, they would be an easy prey. By the covenant of God, the land was insured to Israel. But the false report of the unfaithful spies was accepted and through it the whole congregation were deluded. The traitors had done their work. If only the two men had brought the evil report, and all the ten had encouraged them to possess the land in the name of the Lord, they would still have taken the advice of the two in preference to the ten, because of their wicked unbelief. But there were only two advocating the right, while ten were on the side of rebellion. The unfaithful spies were loud in denunciation of Caleb and Joshua, and the cry was raised to stone them. The insane mob seized missiles with which to slay those faithful men. They rushed forward with yells of madness when suddenly the stones dropped from their hands. A hush fell upon them, and they shook with fear. God had interposed to check their murderous design. The glory of his presence, like a flaming light, illuminated the tabernacle. All the people beheld the signal of the Lord. A mightier one than they had revealed himself, and none dared continue their resistance. The spies who brought the evil report crouched terror-stricken, and with bated breath sought their tents. Moses now arose and entered the tabernacle. The Lord declared to him, I will smite them with the pestilence, and disinherit them and will make of thee a greater nation. 
But again Moses pleaded for his people. He could not consent to have them destroyed, and he himself made a mightier nation. Appealing to the mercy of God, he said, I beseech thee, let the power of my Lord be great according as thou hast spoken, saying, The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy. Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of thy mercy, and as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. The Lord promised to spare Israel from immediate destruction, but because of their unbelief and cowardice he could not manifest his power to subdue their enemies. Therefore, in his mercy he bade them, as the only safe course, to turn back toward the Red Sea. In their rebellion the people had exclaimed, Would God we had died in this wilderness! Now this prayer was to be granted. The Lord declared, As ye have spoken in mine ears, so will I do to you. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you according to your whole number from twenty years old and upward. But your little ones, which ye said should be a prey, them will I bring in, and they shall know the land which ye have despised. And of Caleb he said, My servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him, and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land whereinto he went, and his seed shall possess it. As the spies had spent forty days in their journey, so the hosts of Israel were to wander in the wilderness forty years. When Moses made known to the people the divine decision, their rage was changed to mourning. They knew that their punishment was just. The ten unfaithful spies, divinely smitten by the plague, perished before the eyes of all Israel, and in their fate the people read their own doom. Now they seemed sincerely to repent of their sinful conduct, but they sorrowed because of the result of their evil course rather than from a sense of their ingratitude and disobedience. When they found that the Lord did not relent in His decree, their self-will again arose, and they declared that they would not return into the wilderness. In commanding them to retire from the land of their enemies, God tested their apparent submission and proved that it was not real. They knew that they had deeply sinned in allowing their rash feelings to control them, and in seeking to slay the spies who had urged them to obey God. But they were only terrified to find that they had made a fearful mistake, the consequences of which would prove disastrous to themselves. Their hearts were unchanged and they only needed an excuse to occasion a similar outbreak. This presented itself when Moses, by the authority of God, commanded them to go back into the wilderness. The decree that Israel was not to enter Canaan for forty years was a bitter disappointment to Moses and Aaron, Caleb and Joshua. Yet, without a murmur, they accepted the divine decision. But those who had been complaining of God's dealings with them, and declaring that they would return to Egypt, wept and mourned greatly when the blessings which they had despised were taken from them. They had complained at nothing, and now God gave them cause to weep. Had they mourned for their sin when it was faithfully laid before them, this sentence would not have been pronounced, but they mourned for the judgment. Their sorrow was not repentance, and could not secure a reversing of their sentence. The night was spent in lamentation, but with the morning came a hope. They resolved to redeem their cowardice. When God had bidden them go up and take the land, they had refused, and now when He directed them to retreat, they were equally rebellious. They determined to seize upon the land and possess it. It might be that God would accept their work and change His purpose toward them. God had made it their privilege and their duty to enter the land at the time of His appointment but through their willful neglect that submission had been withdrawn. Satan had gained his object in preventing them from entering Canaan, and now he urged them on to do the very thing in the face of the divine prohibition which they had refused to do when God required it. Thus the great deceiver gained the victory by leading them to rebellion the second time. They had distrusted the power of God to work with their efforts in gaining possession of Canaan, yet now they presumed upon their own strength to accomplish the work independent of divine aid. We have sinned against the Lord, they cried. We will go up and fight, according to all that the Lord our God commanded us. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 41. 
So terribly blinded had they become by transgression. The Lord had never commanded them to go up and fight. It was not His purpose that they should gain the land by warfare, but by strict obedience to His commands. Though their hearts were unchanged, the people had been brought to confess the sinfulness and folly of their rebellion at the report of the spies. They now saw the value of the blessing which they had so rashly cast away. They confessed that it was their own unbelief which had shut them out of Canaan. We have sinned, they said, acknowledging that the fault was in themselves and not in God, whom they had so wickedly charged with failing to fulfill His promises to them. Though their confession did not spring from true repentance, it served to vindicate the justice of God and His dealings with them. The Lord still works in a similar manner to glorify His name by bringing men to acknowledge His justice. When those who profess to love Him complain of His providence, despise His promises, and, yielding to temptation, unite with evil angels to defeat the purposes of God, the Lord often so overrules circumstances as to bring these persons where, though they may have no real repentance, they will be convinced of their sin, and will be constrained to acknowledge the wickedness of their course, and the justice and goodness of God and His dealings with them. It is thus that God sets counter-agencies at work to make manifest the works of darkness. And though the spirit which prompted to the evil course is not radically changed, confessions are made that vindicate the honor of God and justify His faithful reprovers who have been opposed and misrepresented. Thus it will be when the wrath of God shall be finally poured out, when the Lord cometh with ten thousand of His saints to execute judgment upon all, He will also convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds. Jude, verses 14-15 Every sinner will be brought to see and acknowledge the justice of his condemnation. Regardless of the divine sentence, the Israelites prepared to undertake the conquest of Canaan. Equipped with armor and weapons of war, they were, in their own estimation, fully prepared for conflict. But they were sadly deficient in the sight of God and His sorrowful servants. When, nearly forty years later, the Lord directed Israel to go up and take Jericho, He promised to go with them. The ark containing His law was borne before their armies. His appointed leaders were to direct their movements under the divine supervision. With such guidance, no harm could come to them. But now, contrary to the command of God and the solemn prohibition of their leaders, without the ark and without Moses, they went out to meet the armies of the enemy. The trumpet sounded an alarm, and Moses hastened after them with the warning, Wherefore now do ye transgress the commandment of the Lord? But it shall not prosper. Go not up, for the Lord is not among you, that ye be not smitten before your enemies. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and ye shall fall by the sword. The Canaanites had heard of the mysterious power that seemed to be guarding this people, and of the wonders wrought in their behalf, and they now summoned a strong force to repel the invaders. The attacking army had no leader. No prayer was offered that God would give them the victory. They set forth with a desperate purpose to reverse their fate or to die in battle. Though untrained in war, they were a vast multitude of armed men, and they hoped by a sudden and fierce assault to bear down all opposition. They presumptuously challenged the foe that had not dared to attack them. The Canaanites had stationed themselves upon a rocky tableland reached only by difficult passes and a steep and dangerous ascent. The immense numbers of the Hebrews could only render their defeat more terrible. They slowly threaded the mountain paths exposed to the deadly missiles of their enemies above. Massive rocks came thundering down, marking their path with the blood of the slain. Those who reached the summit exhausted with their ascent were fiercely repulsed and driven back with great loss. The field of carnage was strewn with the bodies of the dead. The army of Israel was utterly defeated. Destruction and death was the result of that rebellious experiment. Forced to submission at last, the survivors returned and wept before the Lord, but the Lord would not hearken to their voice. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 45. By their signal victory, the enemies of Israel who had before waited, with trembling the approach of that mighty host, were inspired with confidence to resist them. 
All the reports they had heard concerning the marvelous things that God had wrought for his people, they now regarded as false, and they felt that there was no cause for fear. That first defeat of Israel, by inspiring the Canaanites with courage and resolution, had greatly increased the difficulties of the conquest. Nothing remained for Israel but to fall back from the face of their victorious foes into the wilderness, knowing that here must be the grave of a whole generation.